Grace and peace to you in the name of God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose spirit we worship this morning. The Lord be with you. It is good to be with you in worship this morning. Good to see everyone gathering together as the body of Christ. This morning we're going to be finalizing our, our sermon, last sermon in the Church Words sermon series, and that word is liturgy, and you're going to get to feel it and experience it, not just hear about it today. Before we get into the more dramatic liturgy of the church, let me go over some church announcements with you. This week, the announcements are at the staple in your bulletin if you're worshiping in-house, and uh, that's probably where you're going to find all the stuff that's in your bulletin, the first of which is the gift of presence card. That card gives us a record of your attendance. If you'd fill that out for us, let us know that you're here. We'd appreciate that. If you're worshiping online, you can also let us know by checking into Zion that way. Please let us know if there's something we can be in prayer for or to update our prayer list or any announcements, any joys we can share with you, we'd love to hear about. A little bit later in the service, you can drop that in the offering when it comes by. There's a few announcements in the life of the church. It's kind of a big section there at the staple of our bulletin. If you were to open it up, I'm not going to cover each one. But uh, next Sunday is the is UMW Sunday. There's going to be a special speaker coming, a friend of mine from my last appointment that I was at. She was a, a pastor in that church as well. Her name is Lori Holt, and she's going to come and speak on behalf of the UMW. And the UMW has a handout in the bulletin as well. It is for our candle burning uh, service and information. Uh, your gift uh, in memory or in honor of someone will support the National and International United Methodist Women Missions. That work in 2021 cost $20.23 per minute. So every, every bit of money you give based on that denomination will allow us to burn the candle during the service for a minute for $20.23 a piece. So if you'd like to have the candle burning service and you know somebody you would like to give in honor and in memory to, that we'll see that next Sunday with the UMW service, and please fill that out and, and corresponding information. This is the last Sunday to turn this in for the candle burning service. And then later on that same afternoon is the trunk or treat. That's the other piece of information that you see in your bulletin. So if you're here today, unless you're with my family, uh, it took a vehicle to get here. And all vehicles have trunks. So we're a little short on trunks, and I know you have them. So we need some more trunks for our trunk or treat. It'd be a delight to have more trunks. And so we're looking for more people to fill in this sheet and uh, give us an opportunity. Just come up with some crazy idea, some zany idea to give kids stuff out of the back of your car and they'll love it. I don't, you don't have to be that crazy. It didn't have to be the, the perfect, the best trunk or treat of all the trunks out there. You don't have to be the best. Just be here with your trunk and some candy and it'd be wonderful. But do sign up so that we know who to count on and Opal can reach out and be in communication with you. Next month, we're going to be having a Thanksgiving dinner and service. I think it's been a little while since we've done something like this, and it's going to be a little bit different than we've done in the past. 5.30 in the evening on Sunday, November 21st, the third Sunday in November, we'll be doing a Thanksgiving dinner and service. The service is minimal. It's me downstairs. We're all going to be in the fellowship hall the entire time. I'll have a small service for us, and then we're going to eat together and celebrate and be thankful for who God is and what He's done for us this past year at a time of, of harvest and Thanksgiving. Uh, there are aspects about that that you may need to participate in. The main dish will be furnished, but you'll need to bring side dishes and desserts. Lee Davis is heading that up for us this year. Um, her number is in the bulletin. You can text or call, figure out what role you could play if you'd like to support. She's heading that up. As we move into our worship service, things are a bit different in our order. There's going to be a few changes. You know, just be, be paying attention to the order, be paying attention to the things that I'm saying, and we'll get along and figure this out. We're going to begin this, uh, this morning, ringing in our worship with the choir. If the choir will come forward, we'll begin our worship time together. Uh, they always do a wonderful job, and I thought, why not, why not this Sunday where we're talking about liturgy, why not uh, have them begin our liturgical service, and we'll find out more about what liturgy means as we move on to the service. Thank you, choir, for your gifts, your efforts, and how God uses you each week. Thank you. 
Thank you much, choir, for ringing us into worship. Uh, this morning, we're going to have some communal prayers, some words that we say together. And so as we begin together, would you join me in this communal opening prayer? Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known. By the power of your Holy Spirit, as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, may we hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. And the first scripture we're going to hear with joy comes as our Old Testament reading, comes from the book of Job. This is the story toward the end of Job about how uh, Job is responding to what God is up to in his life and what he's been up to. Our liturgist for this morning is Martha Berry, and she will come forth and lead us in this scripture. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. You asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. In a traditional service of a liturgy, you will often have a uh, scripture reading, and then you'll have a hymn of response. You also sometimes have a psalm that you would say. We, we typically do a psalm for our call to worship, and we do a litany, a, a word in response back and forth. But today, what I chose to do was choose songs of response in, in, uh, for our scriptures based on this psalm for this week, which was Psalm 34. So today we're going to sing together Forever Rain, which is in the spirit of Psalm 34. Would you stand with me as we sing together and as the band leads us? morning. It's good to be in worship with you this morning. You are good, you are good when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wondering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, in you death has lost its sting. Oh, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms The riches of your love Will always be enough Nothing compares to your embrace Light of the world forever reigns You are more, you are more than my words will ever say you are lord you are lord all creation will proclaim you are here you are here in your presence i made oh you are god you are god of all else i'm letting go oh I'm running to your arms, 
hands I'm running to your arms The riches of your love will always be now Nothing compares to your embrace Light of the world forever My heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus. to your arms I'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever reigns thank you all you may be seated what a beautiful job, band and choir. You guys are so gifted and talented. The Spirit of God is in our midst. I, I thank you so much for your delightful singing and for your worship already this morning. Our New Testament reading, the Epistle Lesson, comes from the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 7. And again, this will be read by our liturgist this morning, Martha Berry. There were many priests under the old system, for death prevented them from remaining in office. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. He is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has set apart, been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place in honor in heaven. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifice every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sin. The law appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness. But after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath, and his son has been made the perfect high priest forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be. Jesus has been appointed the perfect high priest forever. And so now we're going to stand and sing together. Rejoice, the Lord is King. Let us lift our voices.
Please remain standing for the gospel reading, which comes from the book of Mark, chapter 10. Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Thimaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him, but he only shouted louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, Tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, Go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated, everyone except for the children, and Bailey Gross, she's going to be the children's sermon uh, person today, so please come down at this time. We'll have a moment for children's time. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you today. So I have a question for you. Have you ever been told to be quiet before? Yeah. Once or twice, maybe a lot of times, like a thousand times. Yeah. Um, Do you listen? Have you listened when people have told you to be quiet before? Sometimes. No. Okay, well, I ask because we just heard a story in our gospel reading about a man named Bartimaeus who was blind. When he heard that Jesus was near, he shouted, Jesus, have mercy on me. And then guess what people around him said? Did you hear? Be quiet. quiet. They told him to be quiet. They probably said that because they thought Jesus was really important and they thought Bartimaeus wasn't very important. But Bartimaeus didn't listen to them which is why he yelled again and louder, Jesus, have mercy on me. And Jesus heard him and said, bring him here. When Bartimaeus made it to Jesus, Jesus healed him so he could see again. So because Bartimaeus called out to Jesus, Bartimaeus learned that Jesus thought he was important and important enough to talk to and help. And it was a good thing that Bartimaeus didn't listen. Now, this doesn't mean that we're never supposed to listen right? There are times when someone tells us to be quiet that we do need to be quiet, right? Like when we're in church or when we're in class and our teacher's talking, right? We've got to be quiet sometimes. But the story reminds us today that when we need help, we need to make sure that others know that, just like Bartimaeus did. So we should call out to help for our friends, from our family, and especially from Jesus. When we do, There will still be people who say, be quiet, because they think other things are more important or they've got other things going on. But we have to remember that God is never too busy. He never, ever thinks that he's too important to help us. He will always listen. So like Bartimaeus, keep calling out to him. And when you do call out for help, we'll see that eventually, just like Bartimaeus did, we are important enough to be helped. We'll also see how important we are to God And that is the good news for today. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for Jesus who helps us see that we're important to you and that you want to help us. Amen.
So this morning is the last sermon in the sermon series on church words, and the church word, the church word is liturgy. And so I wanted us to experience it quite a bit, not just, uh, not just understand it. It's kind of teachery today. It's kind of the nature of this sermon series, though. If you don't know what the word means and you've asked me to talk more about it, um, I'll like, I have to teach out of it at some point in time. The word uh, that we get, liturgy, actually comes from two Greek words. Um, the culture, the Greek world, was the culture Jesus was born into, and uh, it's the same culture that he died and resurrected and ascended into heaven, and it was the same culture that the Holy Spirit came into, so an understanding of what was going on in the Greek culture, and that's why the two words that form the word liturgy in English come from the Greek, and those two words are lietos, meaning public, and ergos, meaning working. So it's pretty easy to see that these two words together to form liturgy would mean public working. And while that's true, that's where the etymology comes from, uh, back in the Greek culture, they actually did put the two words together, leitos and ergos, and it became the word leiturgos, but that word didn't mean public working. Leiturgos meant ministering. How do you get ministering from a word whose etymology obviously means public working? How are those two even close? Well, changing only the ending of the word leiturgos to Leoturgia would represent a separate word in the Greek culture, which meant both public service and worship of the gods, the Greek deities. So one minor adaptation of the last two letters of, of the word Leoturgos, the word we use to get liturgy, meant some notion of worship was included in the Greek culture. From the very beginning of this, this word happening, what was going on, it, it did mean worship, but it's so hard to understand that culture and our words and how languages come together. It seems awkward. But that's where we get liturgy, why it has some connotation to worship, even though liturgy is public working. Today, worship in the church is fundamentally the result of and the response to the great saving events performed by God because God's action invites a response all the time. What God does invites a response. We learned that last week in our church word, covenant. Uh, a good definition that we saw for the word covenant was a relationship rooted in God's initiative for what he has done for the people, but it looks for a response from the people. God's actions invite a response, and worship is one such appropriate response. But it's not the only response. The same was true in our Old Testament reading this morning from the book of Job. God's actions with Job, which are quite, quite a bit different than you and me, most likely, his were uh, a strong action, some difficult actions that Job went through, but it was also a time of understanding, coming to understand God and God giving him twice as much as he ever had before. And so Job's response, which we read in chapter 42, was to be in awe of who God was. God's actions invite a response. And while God does desire a personal response from each one of us, a relationship with each one of us, the response of worship that we consistently see in Scripture and one that we are called to by His Spirit today is one of a corporate nature. Christian worship is always to be a gathering of the body of Christ. Christian worship is always to be corporate worship. The English word corporate is derived from the Latin word corpus, meaning body. And in a recent sermon series, you would remember, uh, just as the church is the body of Christ, our ministry of worship in response to God good, God's goodness is the body's proclamation of that goodness. So it's us doing it together. Corporate, meaning public worship, is what happens when the body of Christ assembles to hear with one heart and to speak with one voice. The words, phrases, prayers, petitions, and thanks fitting for Christian worship. Or another way of saying it is that our ministry of worship is the public working of the church, known today as liturgy. But I don't want us to get the wrong idea here. Uh, that all that God wants for us to do is show up and worship, and then we've done all the work for Him that we're supposed to do. So I want to go to our sermon text for today, the Gospel lesson in Mark 10, and see how God uses us in the world as an example. Mark 10, 49 said, When Jesus heard Him, speaking of the blind man known as Bartimaeus, when Jesus heard Him, He stopped and said, Tell Him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, He's calling you. That is our task in the world today, to connect those who need Jesus to our loving Savior. But that's not how the story began, was it? When Bartimaeus heard that 
Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him, but he only shouted the louder, son of David, have mercy on me. That's how it began. The crowd's first response was to shoo Bartus, Bartimaeus away. Get out of here, Bart. Leave us alone. Jesus is in town. In spite of how often we don't get it, God chooses to use us just as Jesus used the hard-hearted folks around him that day in Jericho. There was no punishment. There was no condemnation. He just didn't pay attention to the first part and allowed them to be used in the second part. Our ability to get it, though, from God, our ability to tune in to the Spirit of God at work amidst the world, that's enhanced in worship. We are empowered in worship to continue our public working, our liturgy in the world. This is why the history of the church, in that history, so much effort has been placed into the liturgy as in an order of worship. Since New Testament times, church liturgy has a long history of development. At times, what can obviously be seen as a pattern for worship has become obscured, even corrupted. And thankfully, at other times, it has been recovered and renewed. The Wesleyan revival committed to taking the gospel into the world by preaching and singing and by celebrating the sacrament of communion, often referred to as a service of word and table. In fact, if you were to open up your hymnals beginning at page 6, you would see the first of four examples of optional services of word and table that have been developed for United Methodist worship services. We get options. These options, though, are set within the context of historical church worship which often can feel very formal in our day. Maybe at this point already, you've decided you, you, you don't like how many times you've had to stand up and sit down. You've seen that that's different from what we normally do. I try to get us up once in the middle of the service, and then we stand again at the doxology. So we, I just do a couple of times. But today, we've practiced more of what people refer to as Christian calisthenics. Standing up and sitting down. This is like the only joke in the whole thing. So... So I'm going to double down and go with another joke. Uh, I had a, a uh, PPR chairperson, somebody who helped in the life of the church quite a bit in one of my settings, and he was married to a Catholic uh, woman who played our piano. She was the pianist at our church, but she was Catholic as well. And uh, she was always Catholic. She, she involved herself in the Methodist church, but uh, he liked to give her a hard time. And so he would say things like, uh, yeah, I went to Catholic worship with my wife the other week, and you know, it's stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, hear what's right. Stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. She just rolls her eyes. Just gives him a hard time. He gives her a hard time. They're still married and get along really well, but uh, it's because they do that. So some people don't understand that. Why are we standing up and sitting down? That's all a part of some of this more historical understanding of worship. It can feel more formal, but it's the basis of our service today. And rather than just talking about the word liturgy and kind of seeing it on a wall, I wanted us to experience it and better understand the work of the people by doing it. And it's not just the pattern, how the service is laid out. It's, it is those public working, those forms of litany, which is a, a word that means word and response. We do that sometimes with our liturgists, sometimes in our prayers. It's not just the pattern of worship. It's also several scriptures being read. In our church, we tend to have one liturgist, but sometimes every scripture will have a different voice that participates in the worship. And that's based on the lectionary readings for the day. Hymns of response that correspond to those readings is common. And communal words of prayers where we speak in one voice. We did that at the beginning and we'll be doing it again a bit later. But I just mentioned something there that, uh, that's rather liturgical and often not fully understood. That's the lectionary. The revised common lectionary is a listing of scripture readings to be used on each Sunday based on the Christian year. The Christian year itself is rather misunderstood to many lifelong churchgoers. The early church created uh, the Christian year so that the whole message of God's saving work in Jesus Christ would be heard throughout the year. That no matter what happens, we preach God's saving work in Jesus Christ. And that primarily contains two cycles. There's the Christmas cycle, which offers Advent, Christmas, Epiphany. And then the Easter cycle, which offers Lent, Easter, and then Pentecost. Within each cycle, there is a preparatory season symbolized by the color purple, and then a festival season symbolized by the color white. After each cycle, there's an ordinary time of growth symbolized by the color green, and that's why I'm wearing a green stole with my robe today, and while you'll see green on the altar often during this time of year, and even a green pyramid on our baptismal font. 
Uh, we're celebrating an ordinary time this, this season. But there's also other colors, differing colors that can be used as well, like gray, pink, yellow, blue, even black. That's kind of preserved for Black Friday. That makes sense. Or Good Friday. But they're used to, prim- to merely liturgically support the season of the church. The colors help us understand the season of the church that we're in based on this Christian year that was created by the early church. However, it wasn't until the 1980s that the Protestant church began to consider scripture readings to be done on a three-year cycle. It wasn't even implemented in the United Methodist Church until 1992. All of this was done so even more of God's word could be heard and preached into the life of each congregation through the lectionary. When preaching out of the lectionary, One is couched within the traditions of the historical church and shares the same scriptures as many other congregations and denominations around the world, all on the same day. It represents a spirit of oneness of Christ's body. While each congregation is one in Christ with all the churches around the world, regardless of whether we're preaching an electionary or not, that's true, we are also at the same time each a distinct body which has gifts for grace and services for which we are only accountable to God to offer in our community. Other churches in other countries, speaking other languages, dealing with other traditions and cultural norms, they're not obligated to minister right here like we are. They have their mission there. We have our mission here. If we give money to another church and another mission, another location, we expect for them to use it in their mission there. Likewise, if we were to receive money from another place, it's for our mission here. That doesn't mean we can't have hearts for other missions, but we are positioned where we are in God's kingdom to minister to those around us. Where the lectionary provides oneness, it must be noted it also lacks a little specificity for that distinction of each place. As you've heard me say recently about Paul's letters and his writing to the different churches, why was that letter written to that church? You can sort of break that question down a little bit more. Why did Corinthians get two letters? Why did Galatia only get one? Why was Romans so long and Colossians so short? Why was this letter written to that church? It matters what's going on in that specific location. You might also ask then why these lectionary scriptures for this church on this day? Or, ask another way, are are the uh, scriptures best for this church? on this day? Are the lectionary scriptures the best scriptures for this church on this day? The way I go about answering that question is discerning where God is leading the congregation as a whole, and then using the scriptures that allow me to preach in that direction. Sometimes the lectionary is perfect for the season of the life of the congregation. Other times I've found that the Spirit of God is desiring me to be a bit more particular, to get a congregation headed in a certain direction. Therefore, unlike today, I tend not to preach from the lectionary. But if you'll notice the co- front cover of your bulletin, I still continue to, make, to take note of which Sunday we are on in the Christian year. While the Methodist Church allows us the freedom to preach outside the lectionary, I always like for us to remember where we came from. But I want to return to the understanding of worship as liturgy. Our church word for this morning is liturgy. And it does mean public working. It does mean ministering focusing on the word worship. Worship is not just the public working of the people of God when we gather. Worship is also one of the closest experiences of heaven that we have in our life on this earth. The book of Revelation is replete with what we'll be doing in the next life. All of the chapters on the screen, 4, 5, 6, 7, 11, 15, 16, 19, all of them have something to say about worship in heaven. And it sounds like this. Day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And they sing a new song, saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Saying, great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. 
Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. This is the public working of heaven right now. The ministering of the saints who've passed on before us. And it's what we'll join in with when we get there. But there's also the same for us on this earth. The closest we get to heaven often is our worship together. John Piper writes of of the kind of worship that we're supposed to do. The kind of worship he found in the New Testament. He said, there was no gathering like this in the world. A people of God's own possession, chosen before the foundation of the world. Destined to be like the Son of God. Bought with divine blood acquitted and accepted before the court of heaven, a new creation on the earth, indwelt by the creator of the universe, sanctified by the body of Jesus, called to eternal glory, heirs of the world, destined to rule with Christ and judge angels. Never had there been a gathering like this. It was incomparable on the earth. We are invited each week to respond to God's saving acts through Scripture and in our daily lives. We are invited into the liturgy, the public work of worship of that kind of gathering every weekend, whether it's John Piper's definition of New Testament worship, which we continue, or giving others a glimpse of heaven. Each week we're invited into that kind of gathering, that kind of worship. In some real sense, what we experience and worship together is the closest to heaven we come in this life. It's with experiences like these that we are empowered, empowered by the very Spirit of God to go into the world and make connections between those in need like Bartimaeus, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we are called to do. Through our worship, we are empowered to go into the world and help make those connections between those in need and Jesus Christ, the one who, as described in Hebrews 7, our epistle lesson, the one who is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. That is how our worship becomes a public working. That is how our worship leads us to ministering, and that is what all the liturgy is designed to do, whether it is historical or contemporary, solemn or exuberant, structured or relaxed. The work of the people of God in church moves beyond where it gains its strength in the gathering of us all together with the communion of the Holy Spirit. It moves beyond that to its great commission ends of making a difference in the lives of others because Jesus Christ has made all the difference in mine. It is just as our closing song states. That's just how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you spread his love to everyone. You want to pass it on. The liturgy of the church, regardless of how it's done, whether we stand up and sit down quite a bit in the Christian calisthenics, whether we sing the same verse in the bridge seven times in a row, standing up with the lights down low, different kinds of churches do it different kinds of ways. It's all liturgy. It's all public working of worship and ministering designed to empower us to go into the world and make connections, just like we saw in our gospel lesson. Let's stand and sing together our closing hymn, because that's how it is with God's love. Once we experience it, we spread his love to everyone. We want to pass it on. Let's stand and sing together.
please remain standing for the prayers of the people. I want to explain a little bit of what's going to happen so you don't get lost. Uh, we're going to begin with a communal prayer together. We'll say all those words and then I'll have some words that lead us into praying over these prayer shawls that have been offered and gifted will be given to a ministry even today. We'll pray uh, a litany prayer back and forth and then I'll conclude with a few words and invite us into the Lord's Prayer. So it's communal prayer together, listening to me lead you into a litany prayer, and then I'll lead us back into the Lord's Prayer. So just hang with me. I realize we don't do it like this every time, but this is just part of liturgy today. Let us lift our voices together and pray to the Lord. All things come from you, O God, and with praise and thanksgiving, we return to you what is yours. You created all that is, and with love formed us in your image. When our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior, that we might have abundant and eternal life. All that we are and all that we have is a trust from you. And so, in gratitude for all that we have done, we offer you ourselves and all that we have in union with Christ's offering for us. By your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and minister to all the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is our purpose in you that unites us, O God. There are various ministries throughout the church which we desire to be directed by you, imbued by your Spirit and set out to accomplish your kingdom's work. This morning we offer to you the fruits of our shawl ministry. Without even knowing who will receive these, they were made by your Spirit specifically for the persons who will receive them. May they see the intricate love and care given to this shawl, mirroring the intricate love and care that God bestows upon all people. These shawls were made to bring warmth to someone who feels a chill. May they feel the warm breath of the Holy Spirit as they wrap themselves. These shawls were made to bring comfort to someone who feels alone. May they feel comfort in knowing that someone prayed for them as they pieced it together. These shawls were made to bring peace to someone in need of prayer. May they feel the power of our prayers as they feel the yarn winding through their fingers. These shawls were made to remind the recipient that they are a part of this community. May they feel touched by your love, moved by our guidance, and held up by your support. Not only do we offer you these shawls, ourselves and our gifts and obedience unto your will, Lord, we also offer every way in which we fall short. Forgive us for these failings and frailties. Incline our hearts with gratitude and faith to believe heartily in you even amid life's struggles. Undertake for us in the areas of our greatest needs, each heart known only by you. And we will respond in praise and thanksgiving by praying the prayer you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. This time, if the ushers will come forward and gather together our gifts of God's tithes and our offerings, we have an opportunity to respond in gratitude with everything that God has done for us. And I pray that the Lord continues to bless you as you give.
now go forth in peace and may the God of, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the God of love and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the liturgy of the church has left the building.